Welcome, everyone. Uh, hi, uh, this is our JOL panel titled Tips from Teachers on Moving Laboratory Experiences Online. Uh, my name is Saif Rayyan, I'm, and I'm the Assistant Director of Academic Programs at JOL. Um, I'm joined here by my colleague, uh, Kirky DeLong. Kirky, can you say hi? Hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. We're glad to have you here, and it's going to be a wonderful panel. Uh, absolutely, I'm I'm uh, I'm really excited about the number of people who are joining us here. Uh, we're also excited about the panel of speakers that are joining us. Um, um, they're uh, an experienced uh, group of educators and innovators in teaching and learning, and uh, they've been working on improving laboratory experience uh, in person or online for many years. And and you know, suddenly as, as we all try to, to move our teaching online, uh, they've been also dealing with this, but using the same tools and maybe more tools uh, than, than they've used before. Uh, they're gonna tell us more about their experience, but we hope that this will be a discussion. Uh, please bring up your questions. You are aware uh, who's everyone, where they come from, uh, which country, uh, what do you teach? Um, and uh, as our speakers introduce themselves and uh, present some of their work, please uh, put any questions in chat. Um, uh, we will wait for the questions until uh, after all the presentations, uh, but Kirky is going to work on compiling all the questions and we're going uh, to have a, a, a quite a, a discussion after uh, all the presentations. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, our uh, panel. Uh, Peter Bohacek is a physics teacher and a co-founder of P Pivot Interactives. Uh, uh, Dr. John Liu is a lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Um, oh, you guys want to say hi, Peter? Yeah, uh, hello. Nice to see everybody here. It's wonderful to see such a great collection and thanks for the, I'm watching the uh, chat scroll by. Great to see people from so many places. It's and, a pleasure to meet you all. I'm looking forward to a fantastic discussion, especially with uh, these very experienced colleagues. Great. Uh, and Jeannie Talbot uh, from California. Thank you, Jeannie, for, for accommodating us. And it's very early there. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's, it's early, but this is a really good uh, panel. I'm looking forward to what all of the other pan panelists will say and looking forward to sharing what I've got. Absolutely. Uh, and Bruce Van Dyke from uh, Quincy College, Biotechnology and Manufacturing Practice Program. I'm glad to be here. It's great to see all the people that are so interested in trying to um, figure out what the best tools are for whatever your need is. And I'm glad to, to be able to present what we've been doing at Quincy College. Thank you all. So first, uh, um, I'll, I'll give the, the floor to Dr. John Liu. Uh, John is the lecturer and researcher in the mechanical engineering department and a, uh, and a digital learning fellow. I've known John for uh, many years. We worked on some of, some of the physics courses uh, when, when he collaborated with us in the physics department. And some of them were actually about uh, laboratory experiences. But then he moved on and uh, uh, he, he managed the MicroMasters program. Um, uh, and, and now he's, he's teaching and uh, researching uh, uh, and uh, currently he's teaching uh, MIT's design manufacturing course. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited to learn about, you know, how this whole transition to remote learning in the mechanical engineering department and in your course specifically has been going. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm so, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you again, Safe and Kirby for having me. What I'd like to share today really stems from, um, you could say, our experience in the past couple months of, of transitioning. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, we were all shocked. I still remember two months ago when an MIT pulled the plug and we realized everything's going remote. And uh, we could think through a lot of how we were going to transition, but uh, we didn't really know how to think about transitioning the lab and hands-on activities that, that really seemed like a black hole. We didn't know where to start. So we've been, I've been in the trenches now for a couple months and I'd love to share a little bit about what our department has been up to and share with you some of what we've learned. And to start, 
So our department, this term, we're teaching 30 labs and project-based classes, and we can really parse all of the classes into three buckets using a very, by asking a very simple question, where does the model exist? Does the model exist on campus? Does the model exist at home? Or does the model exist in the virtual space? And to put some feet to this, let me give you some examples. So uh, when the model, if the model exists on campus, usually we found it's a scenario where the equipment is fairly expensive or it's dangerous or it's hard to move, it's large and heavy. And it also was, was in cases when the staff could be present. So we had two kind of types of cases where the model exists on campus. You know, one, you can pre-record your own lab experiments and talk through them. But then once you have the recording, you host a synchronous discussion. So you, you show your own work, re recorded work, and you pause it at different parts and you ask your students, you know, what should we do now? Or, you know, what about these different options? Or did you notice this or that? And there's also real time. So you notice that uh, I'm showing an SEM. We literally outfitted an SEM. It was already controlled by a desktop computer, but then we uh, set it up so that it could be controlled remote. So students could control whether they're in Indiana to, to India, they can control the computer and therefore perform SEM experiments from anywhere in the world. There's another iteration of this where uh, perhaps an instructor puts a GoPro on their head and has different, uh, uh, different views from cameras and the instructor is basically, they act as the hands and they ask the students, what should I do next? And the students are the ones who instruct and they talk through different experiments or fabrication processes. When the model exists at home, usually we're talking about a scenario where you can significantly or, or uh, meaningfully reduce the complexity and that you can handle the logistics of the shipping and, and also the safety of students actually interacting over these without direct uh, presence from the staff. So we, we had homegrown type experiments where students had to go and they had to prototype their own terrarium as we were thinking about food scarcity in the world. Uh, we teach uh, design by play. And so students were using foam, simple materials like foam and balsa wood to put together prototypes of board games. Here's a one on playing with, with islands. So here you're collecting materials from or, or to home and then you're assembling them at, at home. Or we're sending kits directly to the homes of each student. So on the top here, we, we actually sent commercial CNC engravers to each student that was taking a precision machining design course. Or for um, control and dynamics, we sent, we assembled kits uh, literally from the, you know, contracting the work of laser engraving and, and cutting aluminum struts and contra um, having vendors send us wheels that we could assemble sub-assemblies and then send them to students where they had to assemble the sub-assemblies and then code their own microcontroller to learn about feedback control and how a Segway robot kit can still remain and move, stand still uh, when, it's, uh, when it's being controlled. And then finally, if the model exists in the virtual world, often it's a scenario where you already have pre-existing virtual resources that you can translate to have comparable activities that you were doing on campus. So especially for our design or project courses, here's a case where students are designing robots and they usually have to CAD anyway, but they move very quickly to take that CAD uh, to produce blueprints to fabricate them in the machine shop. But now with the extra time and space we're allotted, we really focused on not just CAD for form, but the function, focusing on the mating between different parts, focusing on tolerances between how the, how the parts fit together and move. And then instead of then prototyping and then testing, you know, does this prototype actually fit the functional requirements of my design? All of that can be moved to the virtual space if you have software packages. So here's an example where uh, in the class that I teach, uh, you know, students have to mass produce yo-yos. And instead of doing that, here we have them through a, a software package called Moldflow. You're actually simulating the flow of the plastic, the molten plastic into the yo-yo molds that they already designed for originally for the machine shop. And then instead of actually thinking through um, how might I 
you know, rearrange the current machine shop or a factory floor, we have them simulate the manufacturing system through Technomatics. And there's a number of different software packages out there. And so you have the practical scenarios and constraints that will guide your decisions, but really you wanna think about the other side too, the pedagogical side. How do you link the learning goals Really, that, that should be the first question. What are your learning goals? And how do you prioritize them? What do you want the students to get out of that lab or hands-on activity? Is it the synthesis of a phenomenon on nano, micro, macro scale? Is it a design for prototyping? Is it design for manufacturing? Is it the analysis or characterization of a process? And so what, are, what do you want your students to get out of an activity? And then after that, think through some of the unique aspects of hands-on learning, the reasons why you wanted them to have hands-on learning. So for example, hands-on learning is good because you can't kind of hand wave through all of the hand, hand wave away. Students can see how those cause outputs directly. Or is it that you want that physical layer to break the often what's bifurcated in students, you know, they, they do homework and then they throw all that out when they look at the real world. You wanna break that by adding that physical layer. Or is it there's something special that uh, students learn when they can feel and they can touch? So how do you link, what are your learning goals and how do you link these different aspects of hands-on learning to it? Because what you need to do is you need to think about both sides. You need to think about the practical reasons, the scenarios and constraints, and I kind of gave you an example, different examples of those, and also the pedagogical ones. So each, what, each of these are gonna have different characteristics. So if the model exists on campus, then in general, when you transition, um, you're gonna see that you're able to preserve most of the real world aspects because that was the original context that you designed those activities. You can also capture the same level of complexity. But then people don't feel things necessarily and often there's also a decreased uh, amount of interaction. I mean, even in the case with the remote control, the staff had to load the sample into the SEM, uh, the scanning electron microscope, for example. If the model exists in the home, then you can capture a lot of the different aspects, but you do have to significantly reduce the complexity so that it can be shipped over or so that students can handle them by themselves without you next to them. And then finally, if the model exists in the virtual space, you know, a lot of software packages, research, commercial, they can be quite complex and there's a lot of input output, but you may miss the physical layer uh, because, you know, they're seeing something that's simulated or analyzed. And then, and then finally, uh, there's a difference in this piece that you have to think through, where is that complexity? Um, so these are the different areas that we found really came up in our discussions when we were thinking about that transition. So first, safety. If your model exists in, in campus, then staff have to be there and you have to think through, how are you gonna social distance while you operate the different activities. Safety means something different for home. How are students going to independently operate the materials or equipment? For the budget, most of your budget, it, when the model exists on campus, is going to go to setting up whatever equipment that you had and now transferring that over, right? So if it's for remote control, the hardware, the, the software setup. When it exists in the home, kit materials and the shipping, and then finally, the software licenses was probably the, the main, the, what composed of the lion's share of the budget when we were talking about the model lying in the virtual world. You'll also be focusing on different things. A lot of our workload in the first uh, category really went to going to set up this real-time, real-time instruction and real-time feedback. If the model exists in home, there was incredible time spent on the assembly of the kits or making sure that the instructions could be followed when you're not physically present. And then finally, uh, if the work, if the model is in the virtual space, a lot of time was spent on, you know, one, the staff, us learning the new software. We had to translate the activities into the, the software package itself and then working with IT. Your students are gonna experience different limitations in these different models as well, in these different locations as well. Uh, now, obviously, we, there's a lot of talk about how students experience bandwidth issues with, with a Zoom, 
uh, for example, that, you know, there could be fuzzy or audio. No, but that's uh, somewhat applicable through all of these. When I mean internet connection, when the model exists on campus is real time control has an additional bandwidth requirement. And how are you going to control something? And if it's, if there's lag, uh, how is the student going to see it in time to react? When the model exists on home, you have to think through how are the students going to receive these packages? Do they have the tools to fabricate or measure? And then is there even a stable space where they can carry out these activities that they want to carry out? When the model exists uh, in the cloud or in the virtual space, you have to think through, do the students have the personal computing resources necessary to install the software, you know, the, the latest and the greatest that you want them to use? Or is this something that you have to contract out, for example, to Amazon computing? Mm -hmm. But there's things that, there's unique opportunities that are associated with all three. We found that, you know, with labs that are on campus, often the person who's closest to whatever you're demonstrating gets a, a front row seat, but everyone else, you know, especially the people all the way in the back, they don't really see anything. When you share screen, everyone sees the same thing. And so there's a uniform experience of the experiment that you want them to analyze and to consider. On the learning opportunities for these, uh, the model laying in the home, there's somewhat of an increased sense of independence and agency. Are they collecting the materials around their home? Are they walking outside the home and looking at uh, the world around them. They have to connect a lot more to their personal and physical context. And then finally, I, I got a lot of feedback from instructors that there was a deeper sense of, there was a tighter loop when the model exists in virtual and you're simulating, there's a tighter loop between the inputs that you're putting in and then directly, how does that cause changes in function or form or phenomenon? And so uh, students were much able much more able to really think through uh, the uh, deeper contextual understanding of whatever model that you wanted them to think about in the first place. So I hope that framework helps you to think through your own, just have to combine pedagogical and practical considerations. Thank you so much and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, John. The, this was a great introduction to the different the strategies that that you can you can actually use uh, at different levels. I, I love I love your discussion around around the the learning and the pedagogical value. My, what I'm getting out of this is that you know probably the most efficient is a combination of all uh, these methods in some form because some of them you know provide opportunities in different areas. And you know one of the things that we've been talking about is that. You know, even after this crisis is over, we will probably continue using some of these methods because they have their own strengths. Um, and uh, this is a good transition into the rest of the rest of the presentations where we will focus more on the virtual and remote part of the experience, which we're, we're all uh, using more often uh, now. Uh, so the next next speaker Next panelist is uh, Peter Pohacek. Um, I'm so excited to have Peter here. I met Peter years ago at the American Association of Physics Teacher. Um, uh, Peter is, is a physics teacher in Minnesota, but he's also the co-founder of Pivot Interactives. He come from an industry background. And you know, the uh, first time he showed me his interactive videos, uh, I was a believer. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is a fantastic resource. Uh, I've not seen kind of video uh, uh, video for me is, is very uh, sort of static. There is not much engagement. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can show kind of something that's fancy, but but he he's able to use uh, the videos in in a very engaging, interactive way. And he's going to tell us more about it. Great, thank you. And and John, thank you. That introduction is really a good overview, and uh, and so it's a nice segue into exactly what what uh, uh, the affordances of interactive video. Uh, and I particularly appreciate the part about uh, deciding what the learning goals are, because for laboratory experiences and for all teaching, right, that's the starting point. What, what, is the, what are you hoping the students to get out, are going to get out of it? So I'd like to share my screen and show, show uh, about interactive video. So interactive video, the, uh, as, as Safe said, uh, video in general can be a passive learning tool. Not that it can't be effective, but, uh, but with, with interactive video, I'll just show you a quick example and then some of the uh, different ways that interactive video can be used uh, 
uh, remotely and for face-to-face -face, uh, learning and for different subject areas as well. So I'll just start with this video here. This is a, uh, a high-speed video filmed of a stream of water, a laminar flow fountain. It doesn't look like it's moving, but it is. And a metal blade is going to come and sever this and cause a gap. And uh, so one of the first things about interactive video is it's engaging for students. And this is something that we've researched quite a bit. And immediately students are fascinated by the motion of the water, uh, why it so, uh, appears not to be moving before, and then suddenly realize it is. Uh, so then to make it interactive, what we have here is a set of measurement tools. So here the students can have a, uh, a ruler that they can use and rotate uh, to make measurements. Uh, protractor, stopwatch, and so they are decisions about how and what they're going to measure. And in this particular case, what we're going to ask students to do is apply a model uh, for how objects move uh, under the influence of gravity. And uh, so they are going to make a prediction about where they think this gap in the water is going to land as it travels along out of the screen. And uh, so after they do that, this is uh, an example of how we implement interactive video in our Pivot Interactives platform, where we have a series of questions. And in this case, the students make a prediction. And then after they do, this is exactly the same event that you saw up above, the same laminar flow fountain recorded at exactly the same time. And you'll see the saw blade pass through and create that same gap. But now the students can uh, find out whether the prediction that they made about where this is going to land is accurate or not. And also, John mentioned one of the things about the complexities, the details, uh, the deviations from simplified models. And here students really get to do that because the width of the gap grows. And so the, uh, an added question is why? And uh, so when you made your prediction, would it be uh, more accurate to say that it's for this leading edge or the trailing edge? And so immediately we get students asking the kinds of questions that as, as educators, we hope they will. Far beyond uh, you know, an equation for projectile motion, but how do these things look in the real world? So that's an example. Uh, besides things that are very slow motion, we also can do apparatus that would normally be difficult for the students to have access to. Uh, so in this case, we're going to study uh, conservation of mechanical energy. So we'd like to have a frictionless ramp, and so we use a, a superconducting disc uh, that sits above a magnetic ramp and so now this can move with very very low friction so the students can see in this case what they're going to be asked to do is develop a model a model that relates the release height so here they can select a different release height and load a video and then see how does that release height affect the speed at the bottom so they'll make a little speed trap here at the bottom use a stopwatch here Right, so now they can measure the speed at the bottom and they can also have other measurement tools that they use to measure the release height. And so then they can build a model here and find what is the mathematical relationship uh, between the uh, height from which it's released and, uh, and the velocity at the bottom. So John was talking about the goals for, I think for a lot of people as educators in, in science models, right? Developing models, testing models, applying <coughs> models, uh, and so in this case, the students are able to build a model that finds that relationship. I'll just quickly show an example now where they can test a model. This is the same apparatus, but now the video shows that the puck is gonna get flicked. But the video ends before the puck gets very far. And so the students are asked this time to make a prediction. Where will that puck end up up the ramp? And after they make the prediction, again, like we saw in the last one, then the video is revealed that allows them to test whether the prediction was right. So the two examples that I've shown are uh, in introductory physics. Uh, oh, I suppose this one is too. So this is an example where, again, students may not have access to, in this case, what we have is an authentic gold medal from the Pyeongchang Olympics and a fake gold medal from the Pyeongchang Olympics. And both of them are subjected to the same experiment. They're immersed in a tank of water and you can read the scale reading and from that, you, the students can determine not only which is the actual gold medal, but which, what is a gold medal made out of. So again, this is the sort of thing that interactive video allows students to see things they may not otherwise be able to interact with. Uh, also things that are very small. In this case, this is a chemistry 
activity where students can explore the surface tension from different liquids. So these are the jaws of a micrometer and they're slowly stretched and this is a droplet of pentane. There is a, uh, a action figure, a bobblehead of Marie Curie in the background. You can see the outline of her, this beige background and also the image of her focused in that droplet. Uh, and so the students can use an interactive measurement tool to uh, measure and compare surface tension of different uh, liquids and from that develop their understanding of intermolecular forces. So here they have a tutorial that helps them develop and test models. And ultimately each section of this activity they expand there are more and more liquids for them to compare. Interactive video allows you to have perspectives you wouldn't be able to. So here's a shot of a tra traffic circle recorded with a drone. Uh, one of them amazed by a Drones are unbelievable. The video is so stable. It looks like the drone is uh, bolted to the sky. Uh, and again, this interactive measurement tool. So here they could explore a coefficient of friction that must exist between the car tires and the, and the road. Uh, things that are too toxic uh, or dangerous. So here students have a choice of selecting different substances and quantities. And uh, in this case, this is going to be mixed with water sodium hydroxide and water, and then they, we also have the ability for them to not only lead a temperature change, but see in infrared, uh, compare these temperature changes, what some of these reactions are endothermic and some exothermic, and so they get a visualization. John mentioned the tactile. They miss that here, right? They can't touch this liquid and see that it's hot. On the other hand, I'm not sure that we would want them to. And then one last uh, uh, affordance of, of interactive video that I'd like to point out is uh, time lapse. So whereas in physics, we often have events that are very short, so we want to use slow motion videography in, in other, uh, in biology, we often have uh, events that take a long time. So here is a 10 day long time lapse of a terrarium that con contains some uh, bean seed and soil and water. And we're, uh, we have a readout on top of the carbon dioxide level, the oxygen level and the temperature. And over the first, four days, we can just see that steadily the oxygen is decreasing and the carbon dioxide is increasing. And that continues. Boy, did I learn a lot of biology when we made this video. The lights cycle on and off every 12 hours. You still see the carbon dioxide going up, even though there are leaves. And we also see the plants grow and move at night, which I did not know. But it's really not until we get a really large selection of leaves here on the seventh day of this germination process that we first see the carbon dioxide go down. This is a really fun question. When we tested this, we gave it to a group of pretty advanced high school students and asked them to uh, use this to collect evidence that photosynthesis only happens uh, when the lights are turned on. And boy, was that a challenge because almost all students, rather than looking at changes in gas level, they just look at gas levels. So is the level of carbon dioxide higher during the day, for example, was a question that they asked. And so we really saw that the ability to design experiments, like what evidence do you need to answer a question is something that is readily available with this interactive video. So that's uh, examples. Pivot Interactives is the company that we have that uh, makes these available, but interactive video in general, we think is a very powerful learning tool. I'll look forward to the questions. Thank you, thank you, Peter. I'm always amazed kind of looking at your videos. Some of these videos I haven't seen before. Um, and uh, I love kind of the level of complexity of, of the activities that you can actually structure around it. Um, we have a lot of questions in the chat, which we'll uh, reserve to the, till the end of the presentations. But one quick question, people are asking if, if Pivot Interactives uh, is free or if there's some sort of an access for uh, underprivileged communities. Uh, we, for, it's not free. Uh, we worked on a model where we could make it for free and we were not successful in getting the kind of funding that we would need to develop the tools, both the videos and the software platform that hosts it. Uh, and so I can uh, post in the chat a, a link for the website uh, and we wish it were. We're a very small company. I'm a, a teacher and uh, my business partner who is a college professor uh, started ourselves and if we could figure out a way to give it to the world for free. So if any of the people here have that means at their disposal that they could help us give it to the world for free, we're ready. We're not attached to the commercial model. It's just the only one we know of that allows us to scale this. Great, and we'll continue this discussion uh, after. <clears throat>
Um, uh, thank you, Peter. And, and next, we're, we're going to hear from Jeannie uh, about her experience of, of uh, moving uh, some of her labs to, to become remote labs. Hello, my name is Jeannie Talbot. I am the physics lab manager at University of Laverne in California. Um, let me share my screen. <coughs> Um, so I am uh, using a tool that someone else created. I use Labs Land, um, and this is a recent use. We uh, had two weeks prep time. How are we going to get labs online in two weeks? Nobody from my department had ever done remote labs before. Some of the other departments were using simulations, but those that that platform wasn't going to work for physics because of content issues and also because they weren't um they, they didn't teach the the um how, how to set up an experiment uh like peter was talking about and john touched on as well um so after my frantic googling i found labs land i was really impressed i was originally uh drawn to the content, they had the content that we wanted to teach, but um, this idea of having a real laboratory somewhere in the world controlled via the internet was really uh, catchy. So this is not all of the things that they have, but this is a sample. Um, the electronics labs was really crucial because second semester physics labs are, uh, needed, we have to teach them how to use certain equipment in order for, the, for students to move on and go to advanced lab. And they had the equipment that we needed to train our students to use. Um, this is a screenshot basically of the breadboard that you can use in the electronics lab. So all these pieces on the breadboard, students can move them around and they can move the wires, they can um, that they can set up the pieces that they want to put put so they have some agency they can they can set up their own experiment so if we ask them to come up with a relationship of the um, electricity flowing the, the voltage flowing through a capacitor in an RC circuit they can come up with their own and they can move around the parts and try it out we have a whole bunch of um, equipment that they can look at. They have multimeters, function generators, they have oscilloscopes um, and a, a DC power supply, and they can change all the settings on all of these things. And learning to use these uh, pieces of equipment, especially an oscilloscope, was really crucial to our program and how we were expecting them to move on. Um, so the way that I set it up within two weeks was I just played with their equipment until I came up with uh, lab experiments and then I had to write my own lab manuals. Now that's, uh, there are some um, resources out there that don't make you come up with anything. You just take the equipment, uh, you take the program and send it to your students and all you have to mess with is grades. Uh, this one, you have a lot more control but you also have to do the work of putting together a manual which I really appreciated because it gave us the flexibility to decide what we needed for our students. Uh, we ran three labs. Um, two of them were circuits labs and one was a radioactivity lab. Um, and the students were able to do all of these experience, uh, experiments almost the same way that we would do them in person. Um, we still held video conferences to have optional lab meetings. And about half the students showed up. We didn't make it mandatory because these are hard times. Uh, and so in real time, if students set up a problematic breadboard, they could ask for advice in real time. And that was uh, really useful. All the people would have their own experiment up on their own computers and ask for advice and they could share their screen and whatnot and get advice. Um, the students who didn't show up for those had to do this through email, but they were still able to complete it on their own time. Uh, this was a big deal for my department. Our grading system is based on lab notebooks for, for labs. And 
that didn't have to change for this. We still use the same format. Some of the students wrote in their own lab notebook from in-person labs, and some of them wrote in uh, digital documents, but we still had the same rubric and we graded it the same way. Um, so that continuity, continuity was very useful for my department. Um, so what we really appreciated about Labsland was that it was really consistent. It created a, a format that we could keep most of our same lab goals and lab formats and grading and structure and just put it online. Uh, we were able to train them on equipment that we need them to know how to use in further years. Um, and also we were able to ask them questions like if you wanted to see the relationship between these things how would you set this up and they would have the choices to be able to put that together in this environment um, the other thing that i really appreciated was the real data um, not you know the, the the real data doesn't match the theoretical and so it's they, they were able to see that because it's they're, they're looking at a real oscilloscope and so they can find um they can find the frequencies etc that uh that that just don't quite match with theory and then c consider what might be happening and uh and think about what's going on in a real lab to create these discrepancies um, and for next time, we are planning to allow them to set up their own experiments a little more. Uh, in the interest of time, we gave them canned experiments because that was fast. But we are able to think about, um, so we, we could tell the students, hey, so uh, you need to come up with a relationship between distance and the radioactive counts or the thickness of the uh, the thickness of the barrier and compared to radioactive counts how would you set up this experiment and then they could just do that based on what is available um, and so that's all I've got on on that front and I am look looking forward to whatever uh, people might ask thank, thank you Jeannie that, that's that's a great presentation I, I really like how you emphasized it you know uh, the the fact that you have to engage with the activities that are provided by a certain product uh, I know that there are a lot of products out there and then you know, you send, you t you, if you have a package and you just send it to the students, you have no idea what they're doing. It's very hard to align to your own goals. So you still have to spend a, a lot of time kind of trying to figure out pedagogically how, how to get the learning goals that you aim for kind of using the product. And, and I think what you provided is a great example of, of how that can work. Um, and that leads us, a lot of questions are coming up, which we'll, we'll, we'll ask uh, the speakers later, but uh, several people are asking about biology. So uh, Bruce, can you, can you tell us more about, about your experience with, with the, uh, virtual manufacturing? Yeah, uh, of course. Let me uh, get some screen up here. All right. So I'm the director, a founder and director of the Biotechnology and Good Manufacturing Program at uh, Quincy College in Quincy, Mass. Uh, we're just a few miles south of Boston. And our goal is to train people to work in the biopharmaceutical industry as entry level positions. And uh, that includes gene and cell therapy, which have come on board very strongly over the last um, few months. And so we've developed over the last seven, several years a program that we've been using as high, for, for teaching biomanufacturing to students in a hybrid fashion. And so I'm going to, so this is the entry program to that. And, um, and you come in here and these are introductory videos. All of this is open source, it's free to anyone that wants to use it. So uh, you'll have access to the link and logins to be able to use it 
And uh, you come in here, you're going to hit the start button, and then I'm going to have to uh, kick out of my sharing and bring up a new screen, and from there it'll flow smoothly. And so you just hit the start button, and it's going to take you into another screen, and which I'm going to show you now. So I don't have a PowerPoint here. It's, um, let's see if I've got the right one. Yeah, so this is real time. So it'll it take you into this screen and you can see up at the top there are different uh, categories. And so this is the workflow. And, and then if we uh, click over here, then I'll come back to the workflow. You can see that we're this program for upstream for, for the uh, manufacturing of antibodies, hormones, enzymes, whatever uh, the industry is producing. And so it, it's broken into modules, which you can see you have buffer and media prep on this side. Then you go through inoculation aspects and you can uh, click on certain things and uh, it'll give you a little picture of what's there and what wave rockers are all about. So this is designed for single use manufacturing. And so this just introduces the students to all the different pieces of equipment that are associated with that and into the bioreactors. And uh, so, and then the bigger bioreactors, and then downstream just for harvesting. But we don't really have much on harvesting. It's just to show you that's the end of the upstream processing. And uh, and so, kind of the academic heart of it is over here in the workflow. And I'll show you what I mean by that. And so we do single use, and because of that, we're using uh, bags. Everything is done in uh, sterile bags. This is this is the buffer and media prep part. It goes from media prep through inoculation, expansion, production, and harvesting. And you can see the breakdown in these different areas by hitting the arrows on the right. I'm not going to go into all of this. Uh, but uh, And then once you get, the, get it made, so this is the process the industry uses. Uh, all of this was designed. I started working with the industry about 10 years ago, and they helped me lay out all, the, all of this. And, uh, and then ATEL Learning e-learning uh, does all the programming for us and I'll tell you a little about that company and we work, we've been working together for about 15 years. But you get down here into the inoculation steps and this is what we do with our students. They start with 250 mil shake flask. They're gonna learn all about media uh, prep and so forth. You hit the side arrows, it gives you a breakdown of the process where you can see the, um, I have the media edition. Notice you're gonna get information in the right-hand panel as to what each of these are about. And then, uh, so you, over here is all about getting the media ready to go, equilibrating it. You always have to validate something's clean before you do inoculation. Moving into the inoculation aspect, and this tells you about uh, cell densities, viable cell densities you wanna start with, and all about sampling to prove what's going on. And then you go into the <coughs> incubating. And for the little shake flask and the shaking incubators, just CO2 input. And these are all the outputs that you can get. And all those have to be tested. And that goes on from there. My students go from, and we do this in the lab. So we have all the equipment in the lab. And then um, this students have to work through all of these processes before they do anything in the lab. I'll introduce it to them. They go home, work through the virtual. And then uh, they come into the lab and begin to do things. And it saves me about 40% of my time because they're working with the same type of equipment virtually that we use in the lab. So from here, they'll go down to a two liter wave bag <clears throat> and the process is the same, except there's a little difference because you're scaling up from one flask to another. And so you get more information about how to do all that scale up. And this goes on and on. And so that's the workflow. And uh, I've had to use this so we shut down the college just about the time they were getting ready to actually do the scale up of a mammalian cells to produce an antibody. And uh, so they had to use, use this. <clears throat> and so we um, quickly switched through this and uh, it showed all the failings of the program, which we quickly would make adjustments to get things better and develop a lot of supplementary material for it. And then uh, uh, we would go from there. So, but these are all just the academic sides. The hands-on side is the interactive side is what I want to show you. And so we've got B labs up here, and you can see inoculation, cell growth, and cell counting. <clears throat> Let me just start with the cell counting, and you have a tutorial and a practice. Now the tutorial is going to um, just take you step by step on how to work in a tissue culture uh, lab. 
for doing working with mammalian cells. And so you can skip, you, this could take you through the prep, and I'm just gonna skip that so you can see something a little more. And you're gonna get in, ultimately, you're gonna learn how to use, how to prepare cells for counting. You can see this, what this is all about. Um, up here, uh, well, I'm in the tutorial, so I can't do that. So I'll, I'm gonna go back and go into the actual practice mode so you can actually see me doing something. But the students to go step by step through the tutorial to understand the process, and then they go in and they have to do this all themselves. And, uh, and so again, I'll skip that because that takes a long time, but that teaches the basic on how to prepare cells for cell counting. And so uh, you've got instructions over on the bottom right hand side, and now you can come up here and your cells are gonna grow for different numbers of days, and you can go through whatever you would like to do. And if you take it on day two and you hit this, you can see the cell densities increase. But the nice thing is, is that you can uh, get close and actually see them. You can move this around to do the counting of the cells in the different quadrants. All right. And uh, all right, so this is the first quadrant in, in, our, in this program, in our lab. We count the four quadrants around a hemocytometer. Actually, we have automated cell counters at school, in the lab, but the students have to learn both ways. And so we, uh, the thing is, we, you count cells, for us, you count cells at the top and on the right, but not on the bottom and the left. And so you literally go through here and you start selecting cells that are viable. You notice here, right now we're in non-viable, so I would have been doing that wrong. And uh, it would, well, we're in viable. So we do this, this, and when you go through it, you're going to put in a number, then you're going to shift over and do uh, non-viable and click the ones there. And it's going to tally them all up down here. When you get done, you can move over to the calculation screen. It's going to show you how to do all the calculations. And so that, that's how that, that piece of the lab works. If we go into the inoculation side, and uh, I'll, I'll do the tutorial just because we'll run quickly. Here's our tissue culture lab, all right? And so you can see it's got everything you need from incubators to a minus 150 uh, storage facility, water baths, centrifuge, microscopes, biosafety cabinets, everything. And so if you want to run through it, you hit the start button. It's going to tell you what to do. Turn on the, on the bottom panel, turn on the water bath, set the temperature to 37. And then you just start clicking the forward buttons. And this is cleaning the biosafety cabinet. And then on and on through this whole process. And I'm going to try to click through these quickly, get cells out of here. And here comes this magical glove that hangs in the air. And then you get a vial out of the minus 50, you put it in the water bath. All right, now you're gonna take, put it back into the biosafety cabinet. And uh, now you're gonna start preparing, uh, you're gonna take those cells and you're gonna run through a whole process so that you can uh, set up a shake flask or whatever you wanna do. All right, so now we're back. Okay, so now <clears throat> for, uh, for us, um, so we looked at cell counting, just a little bit about inoculation, then you go into cell growth. And if we go into here, this is where um, the whole thing happens. So in our, in our program, we're teaching people, we scale up from 250 shake flasks to two liter wave bags into 10 liter bioreactor bags to produce these drug products. And we do all the harvesting and validations. But, and so this is, again is the tutorial. And uh, if you hit the start button down here, it's gonna show you that's a disposable bag. It's loaded into a 2000 liter reactor. <coughs> and it's gonna set up the whole process for uh, what it takes to actually scale up into these larger vessels. And then if you hit again, you hit the, um, uh, this, it's gonna take you through the whole process about how much media you have to put in, how much seed, which, which are viable cells and so forth and so on. And, uh, and so then once the students step through this and they'll get instructions along the way, the same, same thing, they're gonna have to go in and do it themselves. And my students just did all this. I sent, uh, they, we've got batch records just like the industry uses. We send, I send out those batch records and they vessels and then scaling up through all the process and, and they've, uh, uh, they're learning that. So you can see you open the door, we're gonna put the bag in. And believe me, it's not that easy to load a 2,000 liter bag into these reactors, <laughs> okay? We're gonna close the door 
And uh, it's going to move into this particular mode. We're going to hit the, if I can move this up just a little bit. Sorry about this. Okay, doesn't quite fit my screen. Start the process. And now if we come over here, now the students have to put it, assemble the whole thing together, just like they'd have to do in the lab. They have to set up all the gases. They have to set up all of the, um, the base, the acid, the antifoam, whatever they're going to do to get this reactor up and running. And it's, it's a long process. And, but it's, it, it works really well. I mean, they really enjoy it. And it's, it's the second best thing to do it in, in the lab. And so, of course, they're disappointed we haven't been able to do this aspect. Fortunately, in Bioman, this is more of an advanced manufacturing course. We do the same thing with microbial manufacturing. Uh, we don't use this program. Uh, everyone knows microbes grow fast, mammalian cells don't. And so we can run in a week, we can run through the mammalian, I mean, the bacterial one. But um, so I'm, what I want to do is just to close this, stop sharing this, and share some other resources with you that are also available. All right, let's go to all. Okay, so this is the website for the programmer that does all the work for me. His name is Yakov Cherner. Uh, here is our virtual biomanufacturing lab, and he's done others. You can see uh, he built this for a lab at MIT, uh, this x ray lab, and you can see classical mechanics for doing golf and so forth. There's a lot of resources here that, uh, that he's built out, and he and I have been working together, as I mentioned, for about 15 years. And so there's a lot to be done, and we're still working. We're working on augmented reality right now for some of these virtual labs that we're doing. And uh, let me show you one other resource that would be very useful. Anyway, um, I can't find it right now, so I won't be able to share that with you. But um, if there's an organization, it's called uh, Innovate with A-T-E in capitals, Innovate Bio. It is the National Science Foundation Center for Biotechnology. And so I've done a couple webinars on their website. Uh, we can, we'll put those, give those resources to, uh, to uh, so that make those resources available to you. And there's all kinds of tools there for um, things that are useful for high school students or any level of college students. And so um, it's, it's, it's highly functional. All of them are free, open source. <clears throat> and um, you'll be able to find the webinar I did for what I've just been showing you now. And I did another one on protein purification, which is not our virtual lab, but it was built by A.G. Booth. Uh, he's a professor at Leeds University in London. And he developed this program in 1998. It's powerful for teaching uh, protein purification. And so there's a webinar up there for that as well, if, if that would be interesting, and many other types. So. I look forward to your questions. It's uh, exciting to be here, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I'll hand it over to Kirky. We have a lot of interesting questions, great questions, and looking forward great to the discussion. Questions. I'm going to start with some questions for anybody, just to get these out there. There's Towards the end of this, there's been a lot of questions about the future plans. Is the experience going online going to change how you teach going forward? Um, they understand the need to react in the current situations, but if similar constraints come up in the fall, what are you planning for? What might you do differently in the fall with the extra time to plan and learn from what you've done this spring? Anybody? Sure, I, I can offer uh, two or three things. The first thing is now, first of all, now after seeing, trying it once, uh, I think the instructors have all seen how important it is to start with the question, what are your learning goals? And then to go through that whole loop. Uh, we've all seen it in, in one iteration, but now we've seen what works and what doesn't. Uh, so, you know, often, you know, it's easy to just kind of get caught up with this transition, you know, this is what I can do or that, that is what I can do. But if you start with that question, it will lead you to a very good path. Um, the second thing is, it's actually very difficult, to be honest, to say, to plan for the fall because uh, MIT and I, I would assume most institutions right now haven't actually decided on what the fall is going to look like. And at MIT, we're really considering the full range almost, uh, students on campus to total, you know, partially to completely students not on campus. So, uh, but what I can say is that 
you know, around uh, virtual collaboration, you know, so uh, as you can, as you can see, you know, students could see the experiments much more if, you know, the model was on campus and, and they could see it from their screen or uh, collaboration around Dropbox or other software packages. Those often would tighten the loop of how people work together. Um, there's other areas in analysis and simulation where instructors, we were finding that students could learn a lot more deeply because they could see much more, uh, not obfuscated by you know, the, the physical model. In simulations, you can see a lot more the direct link between cause and effect, input and output. And so that was also a learning that we wanted to implement in, in the fall. Anybody else? Two things I've noticed. Uh, one, I think that there's an increased need for student feedback that uh, in the past sort of as we interacted with our students in a in a face to face, there's lots of casual feedback that you just walk by a student that's working on something and you notice what they're doing or maybe you offer a comment. But I've really acutely noticed this difference where you can't see them and they can't see you. And so you have you you can't see their work. And I think uh, as an instructor, but I think also as a student, it's it's disconcerting. And so I think coming up with the ways to be able to give frequent feedback, hopefully automated feedback, I think as, uh, as these systems are virtual and as they develop, if we can come up with better ways that as the students are working, it can give them hints about whether they're doing things uh, right. Um, and then just being, I, I have found that I, my attention has turned towards when students are working something, like I look at it and write to them and that feedback seems to really help. So uh, that's one thing I've noticed. And, and the other is, I think that there's still a need for better tools to allow students to collaborate freely. Uh, so for example, uh, breakout rooms, that sort of thing is the right idea. I don't know if we're quite there yet. I just think we need more work on how students can spontaneously group or can be grouped by instructors. I really acutely feel uh, that missing in my own instruction, students being able to work in two groups or two or threes or share across groups. This group of two or three hear something or see something that another group is doing. We need better tools for that. Bruce? Uh, so what we've been looking at are trying to develop more resources for this being able to actually evaluate how well the people, uh, students are able to learn from the virtual labs. Um, and we're working intensely on that in the background with that National Science Foundation training uh, organization I mentioned to you. Uh, so uh, we have some assessments up there, uh, but there takes a lot of time to build them out. <laughs> and uh, and you, that takes, um, takes money, which is hard to get for people. It's easy to get a lot of grant money for equipment and supplies and so forth, but to get money for people is sometimes challenging. <laughs> And, but we have now met uh, this other organization uh, well, is going to help us build out all, a lot of those type resources. Also, we track people. Our programs can track what the students are doing, if they're, uh, what, how active they are on, on the um, virtual labs, whether or not they're having to repeat over and over, or whether or not they're catching things quickly and being able to move through. Um, and so, and another thing is something we've been thinking about for about three years and we're actually working on now is just um, what Peter was just talking about, uh, a, a, a build out room where you can see everybody and you can have intense discussions about whatever it is. They can talk about what the problems are in real time. And uh, you can, we actually have industry people said they'd come in and work with them, uh, you know, through some of these different aspects as well so that we didn't have to do all the work. So. We hope to have that. And we're at, and I'm working with uh, the programmer, uh, Yakov Turner and his company to try to get this also online as quickly as we can to make it more effective for the students to be able to work in real time and, and understand the processes that they're doing. Thank you, Jeannie. Thanks, Bruce. That's, um, that's a really good idea. Uh, thoughts. Um, I haven't spent much time thinking about how we're going to get students to interact with each other. That's something I should probably do. Um, I've been asked to. Uh, I, I've been asked to pro provide plans for going forward, uh, not only just all the way back to uh, on-campus labs, and on campus, but we can only have half of them in the room or a third of them in the room. 
Um, and so thinking about if, if we are on campus, um, how we're going to keep all the lab um, experiments going while only al allowing them in the room a third of the time. And also we need to have a plan for if we need to send them home again or if we don't ever come back. Uh, so we have, we're working on all these plans. And I wanna reiterate what John was saying. Um, all of my department is putting an emphasis on our learning goals and how we can do better with our learning goals in all of those situations. Thank you, and I agree, that's very important. Um, especially given this, we don't know what the situation is with students at home. One of the questions that's come up over and over again is around, can you use these for guided inquiry or problem-based learning or project-based learning? Um, have anybody tried some of that? Can you share your experiences? Well, I, I don't know if it's any really any different than what I've already said, but uh, students have these projects, they're enormous projects, you know, to start with a vial, you know, minus 150 <laughs> ink, ink, uh, freezer and taking that out and ending up with a protein purified validated protein product at the end. I mean, they're huge processes and very time consuming. So, uh, and, and that's basically what the virtual lab is training them to do. That's what they do in real time, obviously, when they're in the lab. <laughs> so it is kind of, so, so that virtual lab is designed to be project based. It can be modularized, so if you just want to learn tissue culture and how to grow cells, prepare cells for whatever you want to do with them, that's there. So um, I haven't really been able to think beyond that yet, but <clears throat> obviously there is a big need. Thanks. Anybody else doing any group work or problem-based or a guided inquiry with the labs? I think one of the iterations that we've tried is so I mean think about what what I recall is uh, in elementary school there's the whole uh, put together a PB and J sandwich uh, so you know one person has is the hands and the other person is the you know is the talker and the, they have to give instructions and the, the the first person just puts it together right and the first person usually is the teacher and so the student will say you know put the peanut butter uh, on the bread and it's you know clunk <laughs> and that kind of model uh, we've been exploring for guided inquiry uh, because what you can do then is uh, if for example the staff can be the one in front of the experiment they can say okay what you know students what do you want me to do um, you know turn this knob or you know place this on here and of course the the main learning goal isn't uh, precise communication or for instructions like it would be for PB and J but it would be guided discovery because it's kind of like choose your adventure. You want to do this? Okay, well then let's continue down that rabbit hole in this particular experiment exploration. So that's one way uh, we've thought about it. The other way is, as I mentioned, kits. So if you're able to, you know, if you think about a particular phenomenon, if you can break it up or simplify it, perhaps you can actually send it over if, if it's safe uh, to the students' homes. And then you can think through, you know, you can host a Zoom session and walk each step through them, you know, in a Socratic way. All of them are working through it and they can discuss like, oh, I saw this, you know, and then the classmates can kind of uh, converge and synthesize their observations and then you can continue to take them on the next step. So if the materials can be sent home, then they also get that tactile sense in their guided inquiry. Kirky, you also asked about project-based learning. Mm -hmm. What we found I mentioned the example about uh, play-based design and uh, you know where where students are uh, kind of putting together their own board games so what we found is you know the learning goal here is is really about closing the loop between ideation prototyping you know user testing and then back right back to you know the second prototype and and going through that whole loop and so if that's your learning goal, you don't necessarily have to have, we do, we certainly do have pretty, a uh, very built out fabrication machine shop uh, for you know, the toy design course. But if that's your learning goal, there's actually a lot of things that you can play with 
when you're at home. And so we, we found that when we're sticking with that learning goal, we can come up with, you know, we send you foam and you just cut it up with an X-Acto knife and we send you balsa wood and you can, and, and markers, and you can still put together a, a game that tests your main ideas and allows you to perform that loop. And so I'd offer that as an example uh, that perhaps you can think through, you know, what are the, what's the main learning goal of your project course? And is that something that you can, you can transfer over? If, if there are areas that you really can't, like the segue, uh, the segue kit, you know, perhaps there are ways that you can think about uh, contracting out the fabrication, different pieces of the fabrication, sending them a base kit. You know, not everyone needs to, they don't all need to spec out their own Arduino kit. You know, you could send them all something like that. And then, you know, some, some of our classes were giving uh, them um, a small budget that uh, it depends on, of course, also the, the age range of your students. But if, you're, if we had grad students or upperclassmen, we gave them a budget and they could manage it. Or it's you know you sending them a bill of materials and they get to compose their materials and you can order for them. Anybody else want to make a comment or I'll ask the next next question. Okay, so the next question there's a group of them around the experience. Um, how, what feedback are you getting from the students um, about the new virtual experiences versus what they experienced in the labs? Um, are the development competencies Similar? Are you seeing any differences with that? So, what are you guys seeing? <laughs> Go ahead, Jenny. Right. We um, at Laverne, you know, we we tried to keep it as smooth as possible. Um, our feedback has been that they appreciated. Uh, you know, not too many students responded to the feedback, but they they said that they appreciated how consistent it was based on what we were doing before and so that we could move through and have the same grading policy that we had before and we can have the same style of lab. Um, so that was that was nice. Uh, I, I think that was the main comment was the consistency. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, so what I found was um, that it seems that when students, um, well, let, let me say that after I did the webinar for the organization and there are about um, 85 pr professors from around the country on that, uh, they, they all liked it and they're working with the students on that. But what we find is that even though we have the step-by-step -step instructions on the side, you know, a lot of people don't like to read instructions, right? You buy something from Ikea and you bring it home and you just try to assemble it without reading instructions. Well, they go into these virtual labs and they try to, they, they want to play with them, right? So they just start playing without getting instructions and they get lost, you know? And so um, we're trying to, those that once you've instructed them and say, listen, just before you play too much, just try stepping through it so you understand the process. And once you've got that, then you can go back and play with it, whatever you want. And when it doesn't work, you'll know why it doesn't work and you can go back and readjust things. And so um, that's one of the issues that has arisen as we try to get students online. My students just do it because they work with me all the time. Whereas uh, new people coming into it, uh, they get a little lost until they get a little further instruction. Peter? Um, yeah, so as, yeah, I do. Uh, so as far as students' opinions of them and their reaction to them, we notice that students have different preferences. So we notice that when students are doing hands-on labs that often they are uh, worried about whether they're doing it right, whether they are to appreciate the fact that if they're doing an a interactive video lab that they know they can go back and repeat their measurement if they make a mistake. Um, but we also notice that there are students who say they really like uh, and of course, we can understand that touching and feeling the equipment. So as far as students' opinions of it, we see a variety. But when we moved this product, uh, before we started building Pivot Interactives, we did a, a, a test to see what are they learning? You know, regardless of what they think they're learning, what are they actually learning specifically around model building and model evaluation, which are two of the core things that, that are uh, interested in. And uh, so I'm going to post in there a, a paper that we published about just that uh, over a semester long study. Uh, and that was for us the green light that we should build this because we could see that students really were learning the kinds of science practices we hoped they were. So I'll put that in there. Thank you. Okay, so we have a follow on question to that. Um, as an instructor, how 
can I use one of the products and know that the students are actually using them and not just copying? What do you guys think? Well, I think this is uh, why it's so important to have a, a real direct connection with your students. Uh, we're actually spending a lot of time right now discussing what are the best formats for assessment. Uh, and especially as we approach the final exam this time and thinking about fall exam. And one of the things that uh, has really popped out to me is the, the power of oral exams. You can spend, as a teacher, you can probably spend uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes, a, a very short time with a student and get a pretty good idea of what they do and they don't understand. And especially during a time when the one-to-one, -one, the person-to-person -person interaction is so important. Uh, you can consider uh, placing in other kinds of activities like small group discussions or one-to-one -one kind of interviews on those activities so that you can have a deeper sense of what they really do know or don't know. And you'd be surprised at how much more seriously students take it when you actually uh, are going to say, hey, I'm going to follow up with you in person. Uh, that, that really forces them or motivates them to, to really think that they know because if they can hide behind an assignment, right? But they can't really hide in front of you. I did also want to circle back uh, to Kirky, your previous question. Uh, just one note about the student experience. Um, you know, we, we definitely had, you know, we're mechanical engineering. We probably have one of the most hands-on activities in the school. Uh, I think, you know, about half of our courses and we have 500 undergrads and, you know, 400 grad students. Um, so we, there was definitely a sense of loss in the beginning where students were saying, hey, I signed up, I enrolled into MIT for this course, you know, to build a robot or to build, you know. And so we had to manage that uh, in a way that, you know, one, to demonstrate uh, that we feel them as instructors, we really do cherish hands-on activities. That's part, partly the reason why a lot of us are there. Um, and two, and I think this is really important to consider, to not think of your students as a consumer, but to think of them as a partner in the transition. We surveyed them right in the beginning, and we said, uh, across many of our courses, and we asked them, what are you gonna miss? What are the things that you really wanna get? And we were just, for example, in, in my class, we were just in the middle of, uh, we were just about to start manufacturing the yo-yos. And uh, a lot of them said, you know, I don't have any feel of my yo-yo, even though I spent so much time designing it. And so in the last week that we had uh, on campus, the technical instructors were spending, you know, 10 plus hour days just pumping out different yo-yo parts so that we could send them to students. So at least they had, uh, a, you know, they could hold on to something that represented their design work. And, and then in the midway in the transition, we, we pulled them again and we can iterate, reiterate on, on that process. You know, we, we're a big fan of continuous improvement in manufacturing. That's the concept we teach. And we can apply that also in our teaching. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, so this is not as, uh, I, I think following up in person is a really, really good way to do it. Um, our lab instructors have been trying to do that with all our students for sure. Um, another thing that we do it with the labs land is that we are alerted whenever a student completes or attempts uh, one of the activities. And so we can see that they've attempted it. So if they turn in a lab notebook and we can see that they haven't even done it, then we can have a discussion with the student. Um, but also that allows us to see, okay, well, you've done the activity, but you haven't turned in the lab notebook. Um, and so we can, we can talk to that student about what's going on. Bruce, did you have a comment? Um, well, it, as I mentioned, we can monitor them. Uh, I can, other people using the program cannot because it's kind of, it's not an, available for other people to see the activity. It's only available through the programmer, his company. And since he and I interact all the time, I get feedback on that all the time. Um, I do know that um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on people using this as to being able to assess whether or not my students, especially my advanced students, whether or not they really picked up the understanding of the process. Um, they would, uh, their exams are quite long, you know, they're, for them to, because it's all about process and they have to, you know, kind of go through all that. Um, so I'm, we've got finals next week. And so, uh, 
And so they've actually already had some lab lab practical finals, not in the lab, <laughs> right? And uh, they've been online. It's um, so it's still a challenge um, to be able to assess, apart from just the exams that, that I send. And of course, we don't have it. Didn't have time to set it up so that you can prove they're not cheating, right? Because they've got all the books with them. Um, I know they have a lot of integrity, uh, the students that I work with, but again, for this first round, we just have to, we're winging it to try to get, get the assessment. But for the fall, if this happens again, we are, as I mentioned, we're really trying to build out um, ways to be able to test them <coughs> in, in real time, such as what John talked about, face to face telling me uh, what they understand about a certain process. Thank you. Um, we had a question directed at Peter. Um, have you thought about creating a virtual workshop for teachers to play with the tools um, and teach them how to create their own similar labs? <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, yes, so uh, we, <clears throat> to make their own similar labs. Like one of the things I've always wanted to share, but never really had a forum to do it is how to make these videos uh, because it's hard. And I don't mind sharing about that. Uh, there certainly are an infinite number of things that can be recorded and never you know, even scratch the surface. So, but we haven't ever really done that. But I would invite people if they want to contact me directly and they have specific questions. As far as coming up with ways specifically to use our tools. So for example, you can use our tools to create your upload your own videos and build activities around those. Our website has a fair amount of instruction about, about how to do that. Uh, but I really would like to build more of a community. It's something that we're working on, more of a community. Of course, it would be great to make a really broad community of everybody, but I mean specifically of our users because it would be more focused on what you can do with our tools. And so that's a great suggestion that we haven't really developed yet, but something that we're, we're working on. Thank you. So John, we had a question for you. How much tech slash TA help was available and needed to put the 30 labs online at MIT in the two weeks? And how did you guys think about this? <laughs> uh, we didn't sleep. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it, it took a lot of work. We, we didn't, I mean, at, at that kind of time scale, we do not have time to, you know, hire in or bring in extra help. It's simply, Whoever is part of that team initially, you make do with what you have. Uh, so if you had a TA, great. Uh, if you did, most of our uh, most of our lab classes have uh, one or two TAs. I would say for the large project classes, we might also have two to four technical instructors in addition to a, a lead lecturer or a lead professor for that class. Um, but uh, in the in the summer, certainly we're, we're thinking. You know, many faculty take off the summer or instructors have nine months appointments. So that is something that we're considering as well. But I, that, that's a real constraint. This is why I shared about, you know, what's your workload going to be uh, when you think about the different models? That's uh, definitely something you gotta, you gotta think through. Thank you. Jeannie, similar question to you as you were getting this through. Um, what did it take to get this all set up for the students? Well, once I found the platform, um, it it didn't take too much. Um, like I said in my slides, I just looked at the experiments they had available. And you know, some of the circuits that we do in lab, they didn't have available. So I looked at what they had. I messed with it until I found something that would work as a replacement. It teaches something similar. And, um, and I wrote a lab manual based off what we already had and told them to do it and uh it it didn't it took about a week uh to to write the lab and then send it out to the lab instructors and make sure that it included everything that they felt we should include um and then uh back to testing with our teaching assistants they made sure that there were no bugs and it didn't it really didn't take too long um and uh yeah, uh, the, the only thing that I wish that we'd done better is allowed students more decision over what was happening with the circuits. Thank you. Um, Bruce, we had a question about VR that you mentioned. 
um, and how you're doing augmented reality. Um, is it a web interface or does it involve something more advanced or some hardware that they have to have? No, you can use it on your phone. <laughs> so it, it'll work on any device. Uh, we're not ready to launch it yet. But um, I mean, you could, the virtual lab I was showing you, you can, you can use it on your phone. It works on any type of device. So students aren't limited. Um, the augmented reality will be the same. Uh, I can demo it to different people, but nobody can use it yet, <laughs> right? And so, um, but it, it, it will eventually be usable on any device. But right now, we're st it's still in the development stages. Um, but you'll be able to, if you're in a classroom or wherever you are, um, people will be able to interact, be able to manipulate all of these uh, devices, all these bioprocessing devices, um, uh, as if you're in it, as if you're walking and you're in it. And so uh, it's, it's, um, it's exciting, it's still, but we're still developing it, so it's going to take a little more time and money. <laughs> Bruce, I think it's really exciting that uh, you're using augmented reality to kind of bring, transport the student into the environment. Yeah, because uh, especially, I mean, even in non-COVID days, sometimes it's difficult to bring them into commercial or research contexts. Yeah, um, and, and you know, and we're, uh, we're actually going to be able to take them inside the reactors, you know, to, in a sense, to be able to see what's going on. That's and, awesome. uh, and so there's, there's, we've got a lot of ideas we're working on, and um, they're all very practical. They just take money, right, to be able to develop them fully, but uh, we're working on that. So we've got some money from National Science Foundation and the uh, state of Massachusetts and, um, and an organization called Nimble. Hmm. And so, uh, so, we're, so we're working on this, you know, not just for the uh, biopharma, but for the gene cell therapy companies. If you're interested in uh, manufacturing, I just launched a MITx course, Fundamentals of Manufacturing Processes, and we're about to release augmented reality for that because it's really important for us to be able to disassemble products and deduce different uh, things about the process and its product assembly. Uh, so if you're interested in how we're, we actually have a very similar approach to Bruce because we think that augmented reality shouldn't just be available to people who can afford, you know, $3,000 headsets, but you should be able yeah. to use it on your cell phone. Um, so uh, you can enroll in the edX course for free, um, Fundamentals oh, of uh, Manufacturing Processes. And I think we're releasing our first augmented reality experience in a few weeks. Uh, it'll be surrounding the analysis of casting, casting products like pipe fittings and whatnot. But afterwards, a few weeks after that, then we'll be disassembling an Amazon Fire tablet. Oh. Great, I'd love to see it. Send me the link. I will. <laughs> I'll send it now. Great. Here's a quick follow on question. Um, is there a paper describing your VR experiences? Have you written one yet? Um, no, <laughs> but um, I've, uh, I have a lot of information about, uh, well, first of all, there have been there have been some publications about the development of the virtual lab. You know all the, what's going on behind the scenes for all the cyber stuff and so forth. But um, as far as for the use of it, we haven't actually uh, written a paper on that. Okay, um, we're sort of running out of time. I'm going to do one more question here. Um, we have a whole series of questions about. Um, rubric and assessment tools and how they are different for real versus virtual um, laboratories. Um, people have mentioned face-to-face -face tools um, and grading uh, lab notebooks. Um, what other tools are you guys using or have you been using? <coughs> Batch records. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, they have to fill them out just as if they're in the lab every step of the way so that's obviously a tool that that we use and uh, it's complex but uh yeah so i the students all just sent me their batch records and all of their uh data sheets and environmental monitoring aspects and so forth john peter great scope uh, I was just in a discussion about this. <laughs> uh, the nice thing about Gradescope is that, uh, so there's a kind of rubric 
rubrics that are rubric functionality that's implemented in it. Uh, you know, students can upload it within different times and then uh, multiple people can grade the same, uh, you know, the same assignment uh, to get uniform grading. And then let's say you, you grade 10 and then you realize, oh, you know what, I weighted this one too much. You can go back to the rubric, adjust it, and it'll retroactively apply across all your assignments. Wow. You do have to think about, you know, with hands-on, you do, you know, labs and whatnot, you do have to rethink because your learning goals have shifted. Um, and, and you've probably, you've hopefully strategically focused uh, your learning goals on the few that you, re you really think are important and that you want to do. And so your rubric really should reflect that shift. Thank you. I think that's everything, guys. Um, the lots of questions. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you to our wonderful speakers. We've really enjoyed learning about your experiences. Um, and you've given us amazing ideas. But thank you guys very much. And thank you to all of our great guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bruce. Nice thank you, you, Jamie. You. Thank great you, Peter. This was fantastic. Your link. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.